Hi, everybody. This is Pastor Ron from the Church of the Nazarene in Highland, Indiana. Uh, we are sure enjoying doing our videos for you and uh, sharing our services with you. Um, it's amazing to me what God is doing, um, how he's blessing people's lives through this. I really do pray that today will be a blessing to you. We're going to have a time of worship, and then we're going to start a study uh, that will last for four different weeks about God's will for your life, and we're really, really looking forward to it. So I know you'll enjoy the worship. I hope that you can sing along and worship with them. God bless you.
is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand again? What could stand again? Our God is greater, our God is strong. Today I want to talk to you um, about God's will for your life. I want to begin a four-part series on God's will for your life, and not like what God wants you to do with your life, but what God wants you to be as you're going through life. Um, it's really important that you understand that what you are is more important than what you do. And the Bible teaches us that we'll study today that there are certain things God wants you to be the number one thing he wants you to be is pleasing to him. And so I'm hoping this will be a real blessing to you. I've been studying this for since about 1980. It has really, really affected my life and really caused me to experience some amazing things from the Lord, and I hope it will be a blessing to you. When you talk about being pleasing to God, you automatically think about being pleasing to your mate or being pleasing to your parents, or being pleasing to your boss. <clears throat> I heard a great story about a Christian woman who uh, went to a pet store and bought a parrot. On the way home, with the parrot in the cage sitting over in the passenger seat, the lady said, now you need to understand, our home is a Christian home. You need to understand that there are certain things that are acceptable to us, and certain things that are not acceptable to us. And we're going to start out and take it slow, but foul language, uh, using bad words, um, is not acceptable to us. And so I want to make sure you know that as we're going in. And they got home, and she took the cage <clears throat> out of the uh, car, put the cage in the kitchen on the counter, uh, did a couple of dishes, and went off and started doing some cleaning upstairs in the bedroom. And when she uh, went out through the hall, she heard the parrot cursing. And she went downstairs and said, I thought I told you that there are certain things that are acceptable and certain things that are not acceptable. Did you not understand it? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I understood. I understood perfectly. So she went down in the basement to get something and she didn't even get off the steps. And he was saying a bad word again. And when she came back up, she said, you must, you must not be taking me seriously. That is not acceptable behavior. I understand. I, I understand. So she decided to play a little trick on him and took her vacuum sweeper out into the living room that was next to the kitchen and turned the vacuum sweeper on and pretended to be vacuuming and 
decided to shut it off real fast to see if she could. And when she shut it off, he was just cussing up a storm. And she said, well, I can tell you're not taking this seriously. I can tell you you don't believe me. Certain behavior is acceptable and certain behavior is not acceptable. And choices have consequences. And you have to pay the consequences. And she opened the door of the cage, took the parrot out of the cage, opened the door of the freezer to her refrigerator, put him in the freezer and shut the door. Went back and started cleaning a little bit. And all of a sudden she realized that she'd left there, left him there longer than she expected and went, grabbed and got him out of there. Didn't want to kill him, just teach him a lesson. And when he came out, he was going. And she said, now. Do you believe what I'm saying to you? Yes. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Are you going to take it seriously when I tell you that certain things are acceptable and certain things are not acceptable? Yes. 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 Are you ever going to do that again? No. No, I, I won't. I won't ever do it again. Do you have any questions before we go any further? And the parrot paused a minute and looked at her and said, what in the world did the chicken do? He looks like he's been in there a long, long time. I love that story. It sounds goofy that such a silly story could have a spiritual truth, but it does. According to the Bible, there are certain things that are acceptable to God. And there are certain things that are not acceptable to God at all. There are certain things that are pleasing to God. And there are certain things that are not pleasing to God at all. There are certain things that God does not want us, any of us, to do. And there are other things that God wants all of us to do. So I want to read you a passage of scripture that I've been studying since 1980. Uh, discovered it through a guy uh, who was out in Oregon. Uh, it really, it really, really, really has helped me. Uh, the first verse we're going to read, verse 9, is my life's verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 9. And so I just want to read you a passage of scripture that's going to describe what we're going to study the next four weeks. And then we'll look at God's will for your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9. Therefore, we have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to God. So God doesn't want your ambition in life to be to make a lot of money and buy a big house and drive a fancy car, and be all caught up in the things of the world. God wants your ambition in life to be pleasing to him. So in order to do that, we're going to have to find out what it means to be pleasing to him. But I want you to get a couple of other verses. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one of us may be recompensed for the deeds done in the body, according to what we have done, whether good or bad. God is keeping track of how you're living, whether it's good and right, according to the Bible, or bad and wrong, and does not meet his approval. I want to drop down to verse 14. It's so important. For the love of Christ controls us, Paul is speaking personally. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all of us have died. And Jesus died for all of us in order that we who live spiritually should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died on our behalf. This was written to Christians. After you become a Christian, God wants you to get to the place where you die out, you stop living for yourself, and you start living for him all the time. Have you done that? God's going to go back to uh, verse 17 here and talk about where it all started for all of us. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. 
His old life has passed away, and everything has become brand new. And all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and has given to us, all of us, he's given to us the ministry of reconciliation, helping other people come to God. Namely, God was in Christ reconciling the world himself, not counting our trespasses against us. But he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. God wants us to spread the word about him. I love verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. The word ambassador means a representative of a king. You are a representative of King Jesus. As though God were making an appeal through us, all of us who are Christians, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The four parts of God's will for what God wants you to be are in that passage of Scripture. I'm hoping in the next four weeks you will gain insights to the Christian life that you've never had before, and not just insights, but things that you can apply to your life that will draw you closer to God than you've ever been before. So let's just begin by talking about God's will for your life. First and foremost is for you to be pleasing to him. I don't know if you have a <clears throat> pen or a pencil. I don't know if you have one. If you have something you could write on, I want you to write down, in order for me to have God's blessings, I have to become pleasing to God. Write that down. Remember that. In order for me to have God's blessings, I want God to bless my life. I want God to answer my prayers. I want to experience miracles in my life. I have to become pleasing to God. I want you to remember this. God loves everybody, but he doesn't bless everybody equally. God blesses people who are really pleasing to him by the way they live. Some research indicates that possibly as many as 95% of all professing Christians are living defeated lives and not experiencing the Christian life in the way God intended. 95% of all professing Christians are not experiencing the Christian life in the way God intended. If you don't feel like you're experiencing all that the Lord has in store for you, that's okay. I've been there. But let's talk about how you can do that, okay? I want you to remember a couple of things today. The very first thing I want you to remember is there are certain things that God does not want you to do. In order for you to be pleasing to him and experience his blessings, there are certain things God does not want you to do. The very first one is God does not want you to continue living in sin after you accept him as your Savior. In fact, it says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 22, that Jesus died in order for us to die out <coughs> to sin to stop living in sin. Do you mess up once in a while, Pastor Ron? No, I don't mess up once in a while. I mess up a lot. And that's okay. <clears throat> but God wants us to not continue to live in sin. In fact, it says in 1 John 3 that he who continues in sin is of the devil. Holy cow. God doesn't want us to continue in our old sinful life after we accept Jesus as our Savior. But maybe you're not a Christian. Even if you're not a Christian, God does not want you to continue to live in sin. God hates sin. God sent his son to die for us and sacrificed his son because of sin. 
God hates sin. He doesn't want you to continue to live in sin. If there's something in your life right now that's displeasing to God, I hope you'll ask him to forgive you for it. I hope you'll repent and turn away from it. And I hope you'll ask the Lord to help you to not continue to do that. The second thing that God does not want you to do and that you've got to get straight before you can become pleasing to him and be blessed is God does not want you to live for yourself. We just read in verse 15, and we're going to talk about it in two weeks. Jesus died in order that those of us who live as Christians would no longer live for ourselves. Galatians 5.24 says, Those who truly belong to Christ have crucified the flesh, died out to themselves, and no longer live for themselves. The essence of sin nature is self-centeredness. And of all the things that God does not want Christians to do, he doesn't want Christians to live for themselves and put what they want ahead of what God wants. That's why it's so important for you after you become a Christian to get to the place that you stop living for yourself and turn yourself completely over to God and stop being self-centered and stop revolving your life around yourself and start revolving your life around God and around his will. It's one of the most important things in the Christian life. Have you gotten to that place yet? Or are you like so many, many people who they claim to be Christians, but in reality, they're living for themselves. They're doing what they want instead of what God wants. They never even pray about their choices and decisions. They just look the situation over and think about what they really want and go do what they want and leave God out of it. And then when everything becomes a mess, they don't understand why. So the first thing for you to become pleasing to God is to not continue to live in sin. The second thing is to not live for yourself, not revolve your life around yourself, revolve your life around God. If you'll put God at the center of your life, everything else will take its rightful place. The last thing you need to really understand that Jesus made perfectly, perfectly clear in the Sermon on the Mount, the most famous sermon he ever preached, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, don't spend your life laying up treasures here on earth. Spend your life investing in things that are going to last for eternity. Where your treasure is or whatever you treasure, that's where your heart will be. And just a couple of verses after that, Jesus said, you cannot serve God and money or the things of this world at the same time. You have to choose one or the other. God doesn't want you to continue to live in sin. God doesn't want you to live for yourself and then call yourself a Christian. And God certainly doesn't want you to live for the things of this world. Anything wrong with having nice things, Ron? Absolutely not. In fact, if you live the way God wants you to live, the Bible says God will prosper you and bless you. And it says that God will give you nice things. But God's not giving you nice things to just enjoy nice things and let the world go by and let other people die and go to hell and let other people be really, really needy. When God gives you something, he gives it to you for two reasons. To meet a need in your life and for you to be a blessing to somebody else. So no, there's nothing wrong with having nice things at all as long as those nice things don't have you and grip you and control you. Um, the majority of people in America who claim to be Christians are going to church on Sunday and living for the things of the world Monday through Saturday. That's not what God wants you to do. He wants you to have a rightful perspective of material possessions. They're just things for us to use to meet a need in our lives and be a blessing to other people. Once you understand what it takes to be pleasing to God on the negative side, God doesn't want me to continue to live in sin. 
God doesn't want me to live for myself. And God sure doesn't want me to live for the things of the world. It's a really logical question. Well, what does God <coughs> want me to do, Pastor Ron? God wants you to focus on some, some very specific things. The first one is purity. <coughs> purity in your heart, purity in your life, purity in your mind. can never forget when I was a boy, the first time I ever heard somebody read 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 that says, this is the will of God, even your sanctification, this great big word that I didn't understand. And I grew up in church and never understood it. And I went to college and didn't understand it much better. And it wasn't until I came to the place that I died out to myself and started surrendering myself completely to the Lord and letting God run the show and then letting God make the changes in my life that he wanted. The word sanctification means the process of becoming a godly person. <clears throat> One of the first things God wants you to focus on is purity. It says in the book of Acts in chapter 15 and verse 8, Peter, the same Peter who denied Christ in the garden, the same Peter who cursed to make a point with a servant girl, and the same Peter who not long after that preached the sermon and 3,000 people accepted Jesus. What in the world happened between denying Christ, cursing as a follower of Christ, and then turning around a short time later and preaching one sermon and 3,000 people accepted Jesus, and when they died went to heaven. I'll tell you what happened. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came on us, God cleansed our hearts by faith. The difference was not this big, high emotional experience. The difference was a deep, moving experience where God cleansed Peter's heart. He cleansed his motives, why he does what he does, and cleansed his attitudes and that bitterness and resentment and anything he'd had in his heart toward other people and cleansed his desires, what he really wanted. God cleansed his heart. That's how God wants it to work. He wants you to turn yourself completely over to him and let him cleanse your heart. But then he wants you to keep your life pure. How do you do that, Pastor Ron? Well, when God shows you things in your life that are displeasing to him, like I had an attitude one time that was horrible, horrible. I literally hated someone. And the Lord said to me as clear as a bell, you're not going to heaven with that hatred in your heart. You had to get that out of there. And I had to ask the Lord to forgive me. And I had to repent of that. And I had to work and work and work at getting that out of my heart and letting that go and letting it not come back. When God cleanses your heart, he wants you to keep it clean. The way you do that is through 2 Corinthians 7.1. Um, get anything out of your life that's displeasing to God. I want you to take your pen again. I want you to write down purity in my heart and life precedes God's power in my life. Purity in my heart and life precedes God's power in your life. I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, is there anything in my heart, in my life, in my mind that's displeasing to you, maybe even sin? And if the Lord shows you something, get it out of your life. Ask him to forgive you and turn away from it. And don't let the devil trick you into doing that again. In order to be pleasing to God, the very first thing you have to focus on is purity. I want to say something to you that I've never said before. I haven't said it to our congregation. I haven't said it at earlier times. The Lord just showed me this week. Most of us think the most important thing in the Christian life is obedience. And obedience is very important. But purity is as important to God as obedience. Because the Bible says in two places 
in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms, and in the book of Isaiah, if I'm regarding sin in my heart, God's not even listening when I pray. So there is something more important than prayer, and there is something more important than obedience, and it's purity. Making sure that your mind and your heart and your life are pleasing to God. An awful lot of people um, who are watching this video, who know me from years gone by, and who've been in churches I've pastored, and obviously people in our church now, they know that my absolute favorite principle in the Bible is blessings always follow obedience. They know that's from Genesis 22, 17, and 18, where God said to Abraham, I will greatly bless you because you have obeyed my voice. But I want to tell you, even though it is the most amazing principle I've ever known, it is not as easy as it sounds. Obeying how God wants you to live in this word, adjusting your life, adjusting your behavior to the Bible, <clears throat> like we're going to talk about next week, obeying God's instructions in prayer, especially when he tells you he wants to do things that either you don't want to do or you don't think you can do. And truly surrendering your will to God's will and bringing yourself to the place that you can obey him is far easier said than done. People in our congregation will know this for sure. The last 10 years have been the very best 10 years of my life. God has not only blessed my life and our family and Bless this church more than anything I've ever been a part of. This has just been the very best time in my life. But guess what? When the Lord showed me he wanted me to come to Highland, I didn't want to come. When the Lord showed me he wanted me to go back to pastoring a church instead of getting on an airplane every week and flying to a different church and be with a pastor friend of mine and watch people just become so excited about the Lord and experience amazing things. It's really tough to fly around on airplanes and let somebody else pay for it and live in a motel that somebody else pays for it. It's a tough life. Somebody had to do it. I did it. I didn't want to stop traveling. I didn't want to be a pastor again. It's not as easy. It's more difficult. There are far more challenges. I was 63 years old when the Lord dealt with me. I didn't want to do it. I had to really pray. Didn't help much. I had to really push myself to be willing to do what God wanted me to do. And as a result of obeying the Lord when I didn't want to, it has turned out to be the very best thing I've ever done in my life. And I've never seen God help so many people as I've watched him help in the last 10 years, actually in the last five years. And so I want to really encourage you that even though blessings always follow obedience, everybody knows it if they know me, and it's supposedly really exciting, and it sounds really cool, and we're going to start making plaques, and you can buy one, and it just seems so exciting. It's not as easy as it sounds. But I can tell you from experience that the harder it is for you to obey God, if you will obey him genuinely and sincerely from your heart, the harder it is to obey him, the more that he will bless you. My life and our church is proof of that. So let's recap. God does not want me to continue living in sin. God does not want me to live for myself. God does not want me to live for the things of the world. God does want me to focus on a few things. The first one is purity. Purity in my mind. Purity in my heart. Purity in my behavior. You can't do that on your own in your own strength and ability. You don't have the ability to do it. You have to start by letting God cleanse your heart and then you keeping your life pleasing to the Lord. Then God wants you to obey this Bible. He didn't give us the book to say, well, that is really nice. That is a bunch of cool stories. Wow, am I glad the Lord gave us the Bible. 
Nope. This is an instruction manual that he wants you to check in every day and find out what he's wanting you to do and then pray and obey what he shows you to do. The last thing the Lord wants you to focus on other than purity and obedience is dependence. I hope you've got that pen. I hope you can write one more thing down. Desperation will drive you to dependence on God if you let it. I'll bet you can figure out that that's where I'm going to tie this message into a pandemic from the coronavirus. I'll bet you can relate to this whole crisis came out of the blue. And the very first news item I saw on TV about it, that all these people were dying in China, I thought, why are you showing that on the news in Chicago? We're not going to do that. That's not going to happen to us. This is America. We don't have all the problems that other people have. Why in the world would they say that? I know this will really be difficult for you to figure out. There's a lot of people in the world that are smarter than I am. And they already knew it was going to hit us. It already was. We just didn't know it. No one, none of us, none of us ever dreamed the pandemic from the coronavirus would turn our world upside down, change our lives like nothing we've ever known, and literally control our behavior. Whether you can even go outside the house. That's unbelievable to me. But I want to tell you, one of the things you need to focus on to be pleasing to God and to have God bless your life is dependence, relying on God completely to protect your family, trusting the Lord solely to provide your needs, even if you can't go out of the house, to Trust in God in spite of your circumstances and believe it's going to come out right if we leave it in God's hands. Now, I can tell you it'll come out wrong for you and your family if you try to take it into your own hands and operate emotionally and out of panic do the wrong thing. I can tell you it'll turn out bad for you. But if you will trust God in spite of your circumstances, and live by the principle, desperation, desperation will drive you to dependence on God if you let it. This pandemic is either going to make people better or bitter. It's going to make people closer to God or further from God. It's going to make you either positive or negative, but it's up to you, nobody else. We have a family in our church that a few years ago, the husband lost his job. He's such a great guy when he lost his job. I thought, well, that won't be a problem. He'll be out of work a couple weeks. He didn't. And he was out of work for two months, eight weeks. And their bills were going unpaid. And they were struggling to have money for, um, to have money just to have food to eat let alone pay the mortgage. And he came into my office in this very room and sat in that blue chair right there. And we had one of the most heart-to-heart talks I've ever had with anybody in my life. And we prayed and we cried and we begged God to supply their family's needs. I wasn't even thinking about it a week or two later, still nothing happening, nothing good going on. And out of the blue... A man in our community, a businessman in our community, came to see me because I was a pastor of a church and asked me if I would let our church be a part of a program. And we talked about that, and I told him that someday we would consider that and have him come and be in our church for the program. And we were all done with the meeting and had become friends, and I really liked him. And all of a sudden, as he was getting ready to leave, the Lord put my friend who was out of work on my mind. Don't let him walk away. 
Don't let him get away. Ask him. Ask him if your friend could fill out an application in his company. Ask him. Don't be afraid and feel like as a pastor you're trying to leverage your relationship. Ask him. And I did. I called him by name. And I told him we had a family that was really hurting. And I told him they, the man really needed a job desperately. And come to find out this man who is a business owner is a Christian. And he said, Ron, here's the name of my secretary. Here's the phone number. Have him call. Have him tell them that I told him to call. And don't you know, it took a little bit of work. My friend ended up with a job, now has had that job for years, and it's the best job he's ever had, and it's provided for his family like you couldn't believe, because desperation will drive you to dependence on God if you let it. If you want to be blessed by God, if you want to have your prayers answered, if you want to experience miracles from time to time, you God does not want you to continue living in sin. God does not want you to continue living for yourself. And God certainly does not want you to live for the things of the world. You'll have to start living for the things that are important to God. Purity is important to God. God wants you to be working on the process of becoming a godly person. Obedience is really important to God. God doesn't reward his children who disobey him, just like you don't reward your children when they disobey you. And God wants you during times like right now, right now, he wants you to allow desperation to drive you to dependence on him. I want to close by telling you um, one of the most amazing things that's ever happened to me. And uh, it will illustrate what we're talking about, about God's will for your life and about obeying him and being pleasing to him and getting yourself in a position where he can bless you. And when I was traveling, uh, speaking in churches, I ended up in a town uh, called Millville, New Jersey. Went to a church, and uh, when I went to the church, and um, the meeting wasn't all that good, and I was there a Wednesday through a Sunday, and it was the closing Sunday night, and um, the crowd was small, and and there weren't very many people there who looked like they were interested in very many spiritual things. And, and I really felt defeated, and I felt like the meeting had been a waste, and I felt like the whole thing had been a waste. And when I got done preaching, I was so discouraged, I considered not giving an invitation for someone to pray if they wanted to. When I considered not giving an invitation just before I closed the service, the Lord rammed his thumb in my back and said, don't you dare do that. You give people an opportunity to pray. So I didn't want to. We had the people stand. We started singing a song. And I said, if you would like to come and pray, come. I was so frustrated and I was so out of it and I was so defeated and felt like the thing had been such a waste. I didn't even see that on the very back row of the church, there were three teenagers, young teenagers, 13 and 14 and 15 years old. And don't you know Two teenage girls and a teenage redheaded boy, a 14-year-old boy, walked down the aisle and knelt down at the altar. Nobody else moved. Nobody else came. Nobody else did anything. And when I knelt down in front of these three teenagers, and I could tell that the two girls were praying for the guy, red hair, 14 years old, he told me. I asked him his name. And when I asked him his name, the girl next to him said, his name's Danny. Now get this, I'm looking at her, excuse me, I'm looking at him, talking to him, she's answering. So I looked at Danny again, I said, Danny, how old are you? And before Danny could answer, she said, he's 14. I'm talking to Danny, 
this 13-year-old girl next to him is answering. I said, Danny, have you ever been in church before? And the girl says, he's never been in church in his life. And I said, honey, how old are you? She said, I'm 13. I said, are you married to him? She said, well, no, Pastor Ron, I'm not married to him. Why do you think I'm, I said, I think you're married to him because I'm talking to him and you're answering him. You're acting like his wife. I said, would it be okay? I asked this girl, would it be okay if I would talk to him? You know what she said? Well, I guess so, if that's what you want to do. I said, that is, that's what I want to do. I want to talk to him. I said, Danny, why did you come to the altar? He said, because I want to become a Christian. Will you help me to accept Jesus? I said, Danny, that's why I get out of bed in the morning, is to help people get closer to God and go to heaven. And I prayed the salvation prayer with Danny. Actually, all the teens prayed so they could support him. And we got done. And I told Danny I'd pray for him every day, every day. Next morning, I left. Actually, um, actually, I left that night. I remember now because it was in New Jersey and I lived in Pennsylvania. And I drove home and the next week I went to another meeting and the next week I went to another meeting. And the meeting two weeks later was in Ohio. And when I drove home from Ohio, it was an eight-hour trip. And when I got home from that hour, two Sundays after Danny accepted Jesus, when I got in, it was four o'clock in the morning. And as I walked in the bedroom to take my change out of my pocket, Wanda rolled over and said, Ron, there's a note for you on the counter by the phone in the kitchen from the pastor in Millville, New Jersey. I said, Wanda, it is four o'clock in the morning. I'm exhausted. She said, I don't care. He told me to tell you that at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, no matter what, he wants you to call him. I said, Wanda, I am not. She said, that's what he told me. I didn't want to do it. I went to bed. I got about three hours sleep. I got up the next morning at 8 o'clock. His name was Dan. I called and he answered the phone immediately and said, Ron? I said, yes. Dan? I said, Dan, I got home at four o'clock this morning. This better be good. He said, oh, Ron, you're never going to believe it. He said, do you remember Danny? I said, you got me out of bed to ask me if I remember Danny, that the girl spoke for him in his place and they're not even married, and he accepted Jesus? Yes. He said, Ron? Ron, can you hear that? I said, yes. He said, that's the Millville, New Jersey newspaper. Danny's picture's on the front page. I said, why? He said, because I did what you had told me to do. He said, I started getting with Danny the day after he accepted Jesus and I had a Bible study with him that Monday, and the following week he came to church, and the next Monday I had a Bible study with him. And last night, when Danny went home, his mother had been under such conviction from Danny accepting Jesus that right after Danny accepted the Lord, she kicked the guy she was living with and not married to out of the house. And last night... The guy went back in the house, into their bedroom, in the dresser drawer, <clears throat> took out a gun, shot and killed Danny, and shot and killed Danny's mom. Danny's dead, Ron. Dead. 13 years old. I couldn't talk anymore. I couldn't ask him any questions. I told him I was sorry, and I told him I would call him back when I could get my composure. And I hung up the phone on the kitchen counter in our house. And the Lord 
really dealt with me. You thought the meeting was a failure because there weren't very many people there, and you almost didn't even give an opportunity for people to pray, and you didn't have any idea what was going to happen. It's a good thing that your motives were pure in spite of all of your silliness. You didn't want to do what I wanted you to do, and you obeyed me anyway. And you did not know that Danny had a date with destiny. And it was extremely important for you to be in right relationship with me, to get the signal straight and obey them so that Danny could go to heaven. Don't ever question me again. And I promised God that I wouldn't. And I haven't. God doesn't want you to continue living in sin. God doesn't want you to live for yourself. And he sure doesn't want you to live for the things of the world. He wants you to focus on purity. Purity in your mind. Purity in your heart. Purity in your life. And get anything out of your life that's displeasing to him. He wants you to focus on being in tune with him. <clears throat> following his instructions in prayer and in the Bible. And when you get desperate like you are now, depending on him to take care of you, let's pray. Father, sometimes <clears throat> we're ashamed of how bad we miss your best. Sometimes we're ashamed of how much we operate humanly. So I pray, Lord, that you'll forgive us for our failures of the past and that you'll help us to do better in the future. Lord, help us to get anything in our lives that's displeasing to you out of our lives. Help us to stop living for ourselves and stop living for the things of the world, for heaven's sake. Help us to focus on the things you want us to focus on, purity and obedience and dependence. And whatever we do, Lord, help us not to be so focused on ourselves and, oh, poor me, that we miss what you have for us in helping someone else. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I love you. I'm for you. I'm glad to be with you. And I can't wait till next week. God bless you.